Hello friends and welcome to Expanding Wisdom. Today we have a wonderful treat in store for us. We are going to be talking with Karen Glass, the author of, consider this, Charlotte Mason and the Classical Tradition. Karen Glass is a part of the advisory team of Ambleside Online. In fact, she was the, one of the founding members. She has four children, ages 10 to 24, who have been homeschooled using Charlotte Mason's methods from beginning to end. She has been studying and writing about Charlotte Mason and classical education for 20 years and has written Consider This to share the most important things she has discovered about the connection between them. For those of you who have not heard of Charlotte Mason, we are of the mind that Charlotte Mason's educational philosophy is a beautiful embodiment of the classical tradition. And that's what you're going to hear more about today. In her book, well, before I say that, there has been several people who have read her book and have given their opinion about what is contained within those pages. One of those people being our favorite, David Hicks. All of us who embrace the classical tradition, especially the way that the Circe Institute presents it, loves David Hicks and his writings. And in fact, David Hicks not only reviewed it, but wrote the foreword to the book. And I wanted to tell you just a few things that he said about her book before we meet Karen and talk a little bit more about her, or talk a little bit more with her. Um, he said, when I first read the book you were holding in your hands, I couldn't help but think of those late afternoons with PC. PC was a tutor that he spent time with. And how much the classical tradition comes to life in the work of inspiring teachers like PC and Charlotte Mason. He goes on to point out that we need the classical tradition as interpreted by Miss Mason. And these are four of the ways that Mrs. Glass draws it out in her book, draws these reasons out in her book. First, that it's an integral part of what we have become. Second, he says that Miss Karen Glass um, shows how sh the Charlotte Mason philosophy uh, connects with this idea that it's the fit and right end of Padea is a virtuous and wise human being and citizen. She shows how Miss Mason fulfills that. She also, um, David Hicks also says that consider this offers us a vantage point. Well, Charlotte Mason offers us a vantage point from which we can view and crit critique our own pedagogical experiments. And finally, he says the finest corrective in her book is when she debates the simplistic notion that the classical tradition is somehow summed up in the trivium, understood as the stages of child development and expressed in schools, school divisions designated as grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Quite some statements. What a shining review that he gave. And if David Hicks said those things about Miss um, Glass's book, then I want to think about it more deeply. Um, and so let's talk with her. Well, good morning, Karen. How are you today? Well, good afternoon from my side. Oh, that's right. That's right. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, I'm glad to be doing this. I'm excited. Okay. And then, um, and so tell us a little bit more about yourself. You have kids, you know, where you live, whatever you want to share with, uh, with well, that. Well, my husband is in the ministry and my family and I have lived in Poland since 1997. Okay. My kids have grown up. Out, outside the U.S. But uh, my oldest two are in their 20s and they live in the United States now. Uh, my, my only son is my oldest and he's now a Marine. He's finished Bible college and he's a Marine with the future possibly becoming a military chaplain. My daughter is a junior graphics design major and then I have a high school senior who will graduate in, in this coming spring and I have a 10 year old fourth grader. So. Nice. I still have a long way to go before I'll actually be done. 
<laughs> well, thank you. Um, Poland, wow. So what's the weather like over there right now? Unseasonably beautifully warm, actually. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, it's probably, it's probably in the 60s and sunny. That's pretty nice for November. That is nice. I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, and it's about the same here today. <laughs> you, can't, you can't improve on that from our side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we are here today to talk about your book, Consider This. Um, it came out end of October, right? Uh, officially, I announced it on October 18th, I think, a little bit earlier than I expected to. Okay, okay. So it hasn't been a month yet. Yeah, that's pretty new. And... Um, and tell, tell us, for those maybe who don't know anything about this book, um, kind of a, what it is about maybe why and why you wrote it. Well, what it is, is kind of walking through Charlotte Mason's principles of education, but f linking them all along the way to the historical classical traditions. Now, I wrote it because for a long, long time, I've known that Charlotte Mason's methods really belong to that classical tradition. And for a long time, I, I don't live in the U.S., so I'm not really close and in touch with a lot of the trends in schooling, homeschooling, education over there. And so for a long time, because I only read a few blogs, and the, people, the blogs I was reading were written by people who also knew that, I got the impression for nearly 10 years that it, that idea that Charlotte Mason and classical education were pretty much the same thing was more widely understood than, than, I, than it actually is true. Yeah, not so much and, over here. <laughs> no, so, so last, well, in 2013, I guess, um, some people who were interested started asking me specific, really detailed questions. And so I started trying to answer those questions and they convinced me that it, no, not everybody really understood this, like I thought they did. And so they convinced me that writing this book actually would be a needed thing, that it would fill a need. And so I started working on it uh, in 2013. Okay. Wow, that's awesome. Yes, so I've experienced that even on Expanding Wisdom, um, and before actually, when I first started homeschooling, um, th and this always rang in my ear, so I always thought they were opposed, like it was Charlotte Mason versus classical, oh, like, I know. Yeah. like in this battle of the bands thing. <laughs> like, uh, I had a friend come up to me and tell me, um, I was saying, we're going to start the class. We're doing the classical model. I was so excited. And she said, I hate the classical model. I was like, what? She's like, I do Charlotte Mason. I'm like, okay, whatever that is. <laughs> and so from that point on, I just assumed they were completely different. Um, it, and it wasn't until the last couple years that I started um, – looking at some and Cindy Amoris, uh, Cindy Rollins blog, Order Amoris, um, I started just realizing, wait, there's something here that I'm missing. And so I started researching a little bit more. And then your book, oh man, it tied down so many thoughts for me. Um, so for that, I'm very grateful. <laughs> well, I, I'm hoping that that will be the, the reaction for most people because I know what you're talking about, Charlotte Mason versus classical education, and I hate that because it's right. just, it's, you know that when people think that, there's something they don't understand, either about classical education or about Charlotte Mason. Right, yes. And well, what do you think some of those misunderstandings are? What well, would the top are? I have my ideas, but I'm interested. No. Well, some of it has to do with some of the other secondhand books that have been written about Charlotte Mason. Mm -hmm. that they, there's nothing really wrong in any of them, but they didn't focus on the classical side of it. And so they, they presented Charlotte Mason in a way that's not wrong, but it's not complete. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people who only understand Charlotte Mason through that filter of secondhand sources mm -hmm. don't understand just how deep and complete her philosophy of education was. Mm -hmm. 
And then on the classical side, you've got the same thing. You've got people whose exposure to classical education has only been books that have been written within the 20th or 21st century, within the last few decades. Mm -hmm. And those books don't really give a full, complete picture of classical education. Right. So you kind of have to take a step back and get a bigger picture of both. Yeah, I think David Hicks' Norms and Nobility might be the exception. Um, one of the David Hicks is, yeah, David Hicks is different. In fact, in fact, for me, David Hicks' books was absolutely crucial because I, I think I read it in 1999. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, that 1999 is the year that the World Train Mind was written, came out. Uh, the Blue Dorns book, Teaching the Trivium. And so everybody was talking about classical education. It was definitely like the, the trend. Right. And that's almost 15 years ago. But, and I got that whole Charlotte Mason versus classical education experience. By then I'd been homeschooling for several years and using Charlotte Mason's methods. And I, I knew them really well and I had read everything she'd written. So I knew her philosophy well and I knew it really worked. And then I started bumping into these people who were like, like your friend, oh no, not Charlotte Mason because you know, classical education. And so I thought, well, if it's that great, I mean, it sounded good, right? Classical education. So I started reading and researching, but from the, I did not from not on a blank slate, but from my already being really familiar with Charlotte Mason. And so I like to find my original sources. I, I prefer, you know, to go straight to the original sources, no matter what I'm studying. And so I started reading and I would read what I considered to be the oldest things I could find, you know, Greek and Roman authors, mm -hmm. like Plato, Plutarch, Quintilian, and then a lot of the uh, Renaissance era, era writers. And I could see like similarities between these things and Charlotte Mason that didn't have anything to do with the model of classical education that, that people understood from reading The Well-Trained Mind only. And so I just gave up. It was so confusing to me. Mm -hmm. And then somebody said, suggested David Hicks' book, and I read Norms and Nobility. And when I read the way he presented classical education, everything just clicked. And this is so close to Charlotte Mason. This is exactly what she was working toward. And I understood only from reading his book that Charlotte Mason actually was part of the classical tradition. Right. Yes. In fact, I remember the first comment someone made to me that gave me the notion that they may be the same. It was um, someone in the Circe apprenticeship and they said, uh, class, or she said, norms and nobility is, you know, what norms and nobility is for the seventh through 12th grader. Charlotte Mason's volumes is for the birth through the sixth grader. And I mean, as I'm learning more, I see how there's more application across the lifespan. But I mean, but, but that was the first comment I had heard that was like, oh, there's some profound something there. And so that's when, that's what catapulted it. And so we, we read um, Norms and Ability first, or I read Norms and Ability first, and then, um, but yeah. So that's, if you look at your copy of Norms and Nobility, David Hicks actually has Charlotte Mason's sixth volume, A Philosophy of Education, in his bibliography. Does, does he really? Yes, he does. He was familiar with Charlotte that. Mason. He was familiar with Charlotte Mason before he even wrote Norms and Nobility. Wow, that's exciting. <laughs> yes. Um, so one of the things that, um, as I'm thinking about my experience reading your book, um, and my experience um, in my journey in classical education, uh, one of the things that I, when I first started encountering the tradition, it was just the grammar, logic, and rhetoric, like, okay, all of learning is divided up into these three stages, and, and so everything goes back to these stages, and, and I mean, that was, that was my view of it, and then over the last couple years, that has been challenged, um, and it kind of rocked my world, messed with my reality, because I had been, I was like, wait a minute, oh. <laughs> hold on, I've invested four years of my life <laughs> into pursuing this view, you, I need some strong evidence to, to show me that there's more, that I'm missing something. Um, could you speak to that a little bit in your book? Could you tell us a little bit more about what you've discovered? 
Well, <clears throat> for one thing, my, my initial perspective of the stages and Dorothy Sayers, especially Dorothy Sayers being the, she's the first one who ever said anything about that. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing prior to 1947 about stages. Right. Being grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And I like Dorothy Sayers' books in a lot of ways. I mean, I enjoy the, you know, the Lord Peter Whimsy Mysteries and yeah. I've read some of her other books. I mean, she was a great thinker. Yeah. She but she wasn't a teacher. Mm. She didn't teach children ever, and she, um, she 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 had one child of her own, but she didn't really raise him. And and so I felt like I couldn't understand why people would trust her opinion on child development and psychology at all. And if you read carefully, um, what's the title of her essay? The lost the the lost souls of morning. Mm -hmm. She says. My ideas are neither orthodox, meaning not traditional, nor enlightened, meaning I really haven't studied this. I think that she, um, her, her, her essay was actually a speech delivered at a, a summer, kind of a summer activity at Oxford. And I think when she delivered it, it was probably slightly tongue in cheek. Mm -hmm and not as serious as it was taken by later people. So, but when it's all written down, you just treat it really seriously. And I think it's less Dorothy Sayers than people who read her later and took what she said maybe more seriously than she, they should have. Right. Well, and that's one thing that I noticed. I've read, um, I've read parts of her book, The Mind of the Maker, which is absolutely outstanding. I mean, exactly. I especially like the part where she talks about Pentecost. I mean, that's, that's completely aligned with the classical and Charlotte Mason tradition, this idea that we don't have control over the apprehension that a student has. And so her essay seems a bit different than some of her other works, yeah. um, especially the work she did in the mind of the maker. And so I, um, so I noticed a little bit of that too. Um, beyond that, beyond the, that, what, what about the, um, the tradition itself that gives us information about what the trivium really is. Well, it's, I, I think, I, I still, this is when I was writing my book, I kept thinking, um, mm -hmm. oh, there's still, I still haven't read this, I still haven't read that. <laughs> so I'm still pursuing some rereading -re around the classical tradition. But if I'd waited until I read everything, I guess it would never right. get written. Well, but I think the idea, the concept of the trivium, I think it wasn't actually formalized till probably around 900. Cassidorus is the name that's in my head as being the first person. I think there was somebody else too who wrote around the same time, around 900 mm -hmm. AD, something like that. And they, he, they're the first person to write this idea down. This is the trivium and to divide up knowledge according to that but it wasn't stages at that point was it what well was it? it didn't have anything to do see that's the thing if you read historical stuff you'll never talk did they ever talk about stages what but did they it, talk about instead what was it well they treat the they they treat the liberal arts as arts hmm. in fact one of the most interesting things ideas that i've kind of been learning about since i started writing the book is what an art actually is Ah. What's between an art and a science and a subject, That's for example. And if, if, my best understanding, still subject to the refinement, is that you have, you, have, you have content that you can learn, like through, through, the, um, through the process of, of mimesis, the imitation. Right. That, that's a classical practice. And so you can learn content by imitation. But so can, for example, I mean, monkeys. They, that, that idea of just imitating something doesn't mean you actually understand it. You right. can imitate, you can repeat back. I mean, even you know, if, if you're making something, you can follow the steps, and you may not really have any understanding. And so it's the combination of doing something, imitating something, and also bringing human thinking and understanding to it. And it's an art. It's something you do, but it's something you do with understanding. Mm -hmm. So it's not just content that you learn, and it's not just imitation, but it's this com combination 
that makes yeah. it an art. And to the to the medieval writers, that's what that's what those liberal arts were. Um, it's amazing to me, you know, that they they took those things. If you look at pictures from the um, you know from the medieval period, and they 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 make artistic representations of the seven liberal arts, and they always had them in a circle, either around theology or, or wisdom or something like that. I mean, they understood them in a way that is absolutely nothing like stages, and they didn't actually start studying them until it, it was a college, a university course. Hmm. Yeah, so, okay, so that's, you mentioned something about wisdom, and that was the other thing that really I got a lot of clarity on when I was reading your book. I knew that the purpose of education was to cultivate wisdom and virtue. I knew that, but there has been a disconnect about, so how does doing this school subject right here actually cultivate that wisdom and virtue? And it wasn't until you began talking about Charlotte Mason's principle of relation, this education being the science of relation, um, and applying it to everything about the classical tradition that the light bulb went off for me. And I said, oh my goodness, that's it. This developing relationships is the key to cultivating wisdom and virtue. And it, uh, so I was, could you talk a little bit more about that? Right. Well, I think, I think, actually, I think that Charlotte Mason used that word science, honestly, as a sort of, it was like a buzzword, you know, science, this is the new thing. I don't really think that relationships are science, and I don't think she thought of them okay. as science. But she used that expression just to um, give people, make it seem more modern and contemporary okay. for her time. Mm -hmm. But the important word is relationships, because, and you find it all through, it's, you know, the David Hicks talks about dialectic, and if you've read James Taylor's book, um, poetic knowledge. He spends a lot of time talking about poetic knowledge, which is relational knowledge. And it's, you get, you approach a subject and knowing nothing about it, that the first step, if you're, if you're approaching it with that idea in mind of forming a relationship is just going to be, you know, just playing around with it. Like you would play around, you know, you know like kids pull a new toy out of a box on Christmas morning and they don't read the directions or, or approach it systematically they just start playing they, they touch this touch that do these fit together and that's kind of how we build relationship with knowledge you know we play around with numbers we play around with math you realize that oh my goodness this is math when you're doing something else like cooking or playing with legos even or something like that mm -hmm. um and so what is it about the nature of the relationship that is so vital to this formation of wisdom and virtue? Well, I really think that without a relationship, nothing that we learn really stays with us. If we don't have a relationship, I mean, I, I was educated this way. You, you learn what you have to learn, you take a test, and that was it, absolutely it. You never were going to have to go back and think about the material from that test again. Right. And I went all the way through four years of college with that exact perspective right. of education. Um, I actually consider my own education didn't even start until I started thinking about homeschooling my, my own children because up till then I had just seen education as doing well on tests and I did well on tests. So, you know, I must, it was okay. But with, when you have a relationship to knowledge, mm -hmm. and you actually care about something that you're learning, you're motivated to learn more, for one thing. And it, you can start building that worldview, that picture of how one thing connects to another thing. And ultimately, the reason it has connected to wisdom and virtue is because when you care about something, you're actually going to be eventually motivated to do something act and behave according to what you know. Yes. And that is yes. virtue. That and, is, and I got that definition from David Hicks. It's not right. mom, but it's very easy to find it as you read back through Charlotte Mason and other classical authors. 
Yes. I, in fact, I was thinking David Hicks as soon as you said that because he t constantly talks about it's in the realm of action. Like it must, all education must lead to right action. Um, exactly. And I lost the other thought. That's okay. <laughs> um, okay. So um, with the relationship, the other thing that I thought of was the idea that actually David Hicks talks about in, in this chapter, the promise of Christian paideia, um, which points to a couple things. First of all, this, I think it, it gives us more information about why relationship is important, is important uh, because we're dealing with the love. Um, but also it speaks to this other hurdle that many have to jump over or wrestle with, or it just, they just ignore the tradition because they think this is um, that a classical education is not a Christian education. In fact, I've had one, I had a comment one time that said, I, I don't think classical and Charlotte Mason are the same because um, classical, you're reading the pagans and, and I, well, which was interesting because Charlotte read the pagans, but I don't think most people realize how much she was influenced by the, even the pagan authors within the tradition? I, I don't know about that. I, until I actually started digging in on purpose, looking for it, I did not realize how deliberate Charlotte Mason's connection to the classical authors actually was. Mm -hmm. On purpose, she refers to them, you know, Plutarch and Plato, I mean, very, very specifically, I, when I was just interested in learning about her methods, I never really paid attention to the fact that she was connecting her ideas with those ideas of the past. But I, I think one of Charlotte Mason's most important principles, and the thing that makes it so hard for Christians, is because they still actually have, in their own minds, this idea of a dichotomy. That there's secular knowledge and sacred knowledge. Wow. That there's Christian and there's non-Christian rather than understanding that it doesn't matter where truth exists or where you find it, if it's true, it's part of God's truth. And so you can read a book that's full of... Can I ask you a question, a clarifying question about that? How is what you just said different from relativism? Well, because you still have to have an absolute standard. We have, an, I mean, as Christians, we have the Bible as an absolute standard. So when we read something that doesn't agree with it, we know it's not true. Right. But sometimes I do, when I write about truth, I'll write about truth with a small T or a capital T because there are things, there are secular things, including the pagans very much so. They, they had a lot of truth with a small T. They didn't have the truth, the capital T. Right. And Christian educators from Augustine to Erasmus to Charlotte Mason we're able to find that small truth T without disturbing their understanding that there was a greater truth that the pagans didn't have. That always just astounds me when I, um, especially when I read Plato and um, Socrates' dialogues, just how far he was able to go without Christ. Without any revelation at all. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think, and I don't know the place of this, but someone I respect who is widely read said this. He said that Socrates actually said that in order for this whole God thing to work, God would have to come down and die for man. Wow. I think I may have read or heard that somewhere too, but I have never found it. Yeah. Personally. I think I need to post it maybe on Facebook. Who said this to me? Where did you get it? <laughs> I think it might be in the Republic, but I'll, I'll have to ask. Mm -hmm. so th so that's pretty amazing so truth can be found I mean the truth is the truth but so we can discover it in many places sometimes that truth that is the truth it, it is in a book is in Plato is in Homer is of course in the Word of God is in you know more places than the Word of God or the truth is not contained to a certain type of book is what I'm hearing you say. No, no, I don't think so. I think truth is found in many places. And 
I, I honestly think if you really honestly had never had another book and you had the Bible and you sat down and you never read another thing all your life and you really read it well, you probably would have a perfectly good education in terms of understanding human character and virtue and wisdom and you wouldn't need anything else. But nobody does that. Nobody, nobody really devotes themselves to the Bible at that level. Mm -hmm. And doing that, there's a lot of things you wouldn't necessarily understand. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I always have to laugh sometimes about people, Christians wanting to um, avoid s s pagan stories because they contain these horrible things, like these people did these awful things. And it's like, have you read the Old Testament? <laughs> right. Um, they did some pretty terrible things. Pretty terrible. And God considered that to be part of our education because he yeah. told the he told the Israelites, oh, read these stories to your children. It's like, those are some pretty um, explicit and violent stories. Hmm. Um, yeah. the, the, the thing about the, the, the real pagan literature, like, like Homer, is the whole point of it, the reason it became kind of the standard around which classical education was conducted for them was because they were trying to present that idea of, a, of, a, of an ideal, present what, this is what virtue would look like. And it doesn't look the same in every situation. It's not that it's a relative, it's just that you have different circumstances, and whereas in one circumstance, the right thing to do might be to pull out a sword and kill somebody, another circumstance, the right thing to do might be to you know, stand down and dialogue and, you know, have a conversation. Right. It's not that simple for Christians either. It's not that truth is relative. It's just that it's not so easily known all the time. Right. Discernment and judgment takes time. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I know for myself that reading Homer helped me understand the New Testament better. Um, idea, I mean, that was the Greek culture was the culture, the ancient Greek culture was the culture that the Jesus Christ came into that's the backdrop for the new testament and so i've understood so many of the verses better because i've marinated on the iliad and the odyssey um even like verses about marriage that i used to have a problem with i don't have a problem with anymore because of contemplating penelope and odysseus's relationship i mean it's just been profound for me i mean who who would have thought homer helps me understand the Bible. No, it's so clearly you read them, you know, within the greater light of scripture. It's not that you, you, you didn't, and if you ran across anything that did contradict the Bible, I'm sure you just, you know, set it aside. Yeah, because all th I think is Andrew Kern who talks about all things being ours. I mean, well, the Bible talks about it, but I think he's been a popular one that um, has made the conversation a little bit louder and that we have dominion over that. All mm -hmm. things are ours. We can judge it and give it its proper place, and, mm -hmm. and which is part of the, which is part of that big picture, you know, the idea of understanding all how all things fit together. Right, right, right. That's awesome. So I was looking at um, my my notes and just kind of looking at some of my favorite quotes from your book, and um, let me find it real quick. While I'm finding it, um, do you want to tell everyone about your um, your study guide and maybe what would be the, because um, I didn't even realize you had a study guide until you told me in the email. And so um, right. tell us more about that and what maybe, how we should yeah. do it and that sort of thing. Well, I, well I, was, I had my website up and in the waiting time between the website being there and the information that there was going to be a book and the book actually coming out, somebody sent me a question one time and said, you know, we, I want, we think we want to use your book with our, our book to study discussion group and are there any questions at the end of the chapters? Well, there weren't, <laughs> there weren't going to be. Uh, I just never even thought of doing it, never crossed my mind. And so um, in that waiting period while I wasn't quite ready to publish it, I thought, well, I, I, I could do that. I could just write some questions and make them available separately. And so that's what I did, just a few questions for every chapter. And then um, I, put, I, I added in a lot of the quotes that I wasn't able to put, never quite made it into the, uh, 
into the book itself. I had collected an awful lot of quotes kind of surrounding the topic, but I could only put in the ones that were going to work with my text. So I had a lot left over and the study guide became a place where I could tuck in a few more of those quotes from Montaigne and people like that. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, and then it, it just, it was just, my husband did all the formatting. And so I was just about to finish and I thought, you know, I could add one more thing and suggest some reading from Charlotte Mason series around the same topic for each chapter. And so I threw that all in there. My husband formatted it and it is available. I had originally planned to make it available for free just until the end of November, but I will probably keep it available as it is as a PDF on my website, Karen Grass Okay. And I'm, I'm going to make a hard copy available, but we're still working on that. Okay. Well, but printing it out is just fine. Good. Well, I will make sure to link to that so people can um, make it available and to the website and, and all of that. Um, so I, I found the quote and it, I mean, when I say, I highlighted half of your book. <laughs> I have like all my different colors. I like highlighted all the, my blues for what I thought were quotables. And then I had used orange for everything I like had to take action on right now that like really inspired me to action. And so one of my orange uh, highlights was um, in, it's in the chapter begins with a single step. And it's the things that make it truly classical, truly worthwhile to pursue, aren't school subjects at all, but principles that add depth and cohesion to everything we study in all areas of the curriculum. And I just love that quote. Um, it brings to mind things about, you talked a lot about the idea of synthesis. Um, and right before that, you're talking about humility. Um, and the need for humility to actually enter into this tradition um, and and these principles. So this idea of the synthesis, the principles, and the humility um, was the, the other big revelation. Well, and I knew it was needed, but I didn't realize to the depth that it was tied to entering into this tradition. It's, yeah, it's one of those things that, no, you don't really talk about it. Nobody talks about it. It's not like a primary subject in anything I've ever read about education, right. almost anywhere. But it is absolutely critical because as soon as you don't have it, as soon as it goes, it tur really, I mean, it's not like you can, um, there's no middle ground. You've either got humility or you've got pride. There's really no neutral territory between them. So you move from humility to some form of pride, and, and that's it. At the end, you cannot go any further in, in educating yourself or learning. Yeah. yeah. So we've actually brought up to education, and yeah, we never talk about it. Um, almost every time I've ever brought it up in a conversation, people have had that same reaction. It's like, oh, you're right. Well, I see, but it isn't anywhere. So, yeah, a whole, I devoted a whole chapter to it. Right. Well, and, I mean, I started thinking about it for the first time when I started learning how to do Socratic instruction, how to lead a Socratic dialogue. And, um, of course, I first started learning how to do that by reading Plato's dialogues um, and watching his process. And... And that's when I first started realizing how important humility was, that there is no possible way that I can lead anyone to the truth unless I'm at the foot of the cross. It's just not possible. I can't. And my students aren't going to be able to receive if they are being prideful and just want their way. And so the need for Jesus <laughs> is so huge. It's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah. Right. So always being ready to ask the question and listen to the answer, you right. know, I think is a, the simplest way of, of keeping yourself in that position, you know, and never thinking, oh, okay, I got it all because, you know, right. Well, I certainly don't. We, none of us. <laughs> so the last question I wanted to ask you is um, just about the nature of principles. And, and maybe we made a couple comments on it, but I wanted to, to deal with it directly. Um, the dealing, looking at and studying the principles 
allowing ourselves to be informed by the principles versus looking and like memorizing the particulars of what to do, the what versus the why. Mm -hmm. um, I guess really, that was a, if you if you looked at if you if you looked at the study guide, you see I have this. I I, I thought of that this is sort of joke that we've probably heard, you know, with about uh, the young wife who's cutting the end off of her ham every time she cooks it. And her husband was like, well, why are you doing that? She said, well, because my mom was did, always cut the end off the ham. So they asked her and she said, well, I, because my mother always did that, cut the end off. Yeah. And so when they called her mother, she said, well, I have a really small pan, so I always cut the end off so the ham would fit in the pan. So they were doing something that had no purpose at all. Mm. And it was, you know, it just it was just for the sake of a of a tradition without having an, without any understanding. Right. And almost any tradition or or practice that starts, even if it's based on a principle in the first place, if it gets disconnected from the principle, it becomes just about as meaningless as that. Mm. That's really what happened in classical education. In, at least in England, the only, the only trail that I'm really familiar with, you know, because classical education, you know, was in, it had a place in Italy and France and other European countries, but I, I have no idea what became of it in those countries. Right. I don't know what happened to it in England. And when the Enlightenment, with the Enlightenment, which is, you know, around the 1700s, where thinkers and philosophers were very deliberately throwing out the concept of God, Christianity, religion, and the idea that you could know anything synthetically. Like they just started that process of we have to analyze everything. We have to break it all down scientifically and approach all of our knowledge in this way. Well, that, that's the beginning of, of things, and that's clear back in the 1700s. I mean, that's a long time ago. That was the beginning of classical education kind of losing touch with its principles. And without the principles, it became kind of like uh, just tradition that people were going to school and they were reading those classical authors, but they really were not reading them for the reasons that people read them in the past. For the, like you talked about, you know, for example, for enlightenment, or a broader understanding of humanity or ideals, they were just focusing on the grammar, and the, right. the vocabulary. I read a, um, in, the, in the course of writing my book, I read an interview that John Henry Newman writes about in his book, The Idea of a University. And this is like in the 1800s, 19th century. And he's talking about these how terrible it is that these young men were coming in to interview for Oxford University and they would just have this interview and they would talk to them about, you know, what they had read, what they had learned and studied. And it was all about grammar. It was unbelievable. They were like, you know, they asked them what they read and when they told them what books they had read, in Latin, of course, then they would start asking them questions about what this word means and why this form of this word is used. And the, the, the students were supposed to give them really complex, focused information about grammar without any idea. And then, and then he, he, but he thought that was a good thing. He thought that's how it should be. And then he described this other fictional, I think, student who came in and was just talking about what he had read and how he had enjoyed it. And he was just like, oh, no, that's not good enough. And he doesn't know anything because he didn't, he couldn't answer all the grammatical questions. Wow. That's what classical education became when they focused on practices, not principles. Right, right. And the other thing I found, and, and I think this um, is important for, you know, when we think, I think all of us, whether we're, we connect with Charlotte Mason, um, you know, whatever tradition or the classical, whatever tradition we say that we're a part of, that we all want something different for our kids and we all want um, something different for our society. And I think that's one of the reasons why your book is so important because it shows us the unity of two traditions that many have thought are different. And I just can't help but think, imagine the power of 
us uniting and being and, and proceeding in unity together to fight this good fight to help reform education to you know teach other parents to widen what we can lay before people as a good a true a beautiful thing to pursue right i really hope and maybe it's just a dream but i actually hope that writing this book will draw charlotte mason kind of into acceptance as a valid way of of working out classical education yeah and this is just as valid a way as any other certainly as valid as dorothy sayers in the stages way mm -hmm. at the very least and and i i'm hoping that that perception because she has so much to offer and i think that classical education as it's practiced in america today could be better if people started paying more attention to principles amen i completely <laughs> agree i think that and, and, and this is just my own experience. There's a point where you're faced with an idea and you have some initial thoughts about the idea and you realize as you're thinking about it that, oh, this isn't what I've always believed. I have, and if it's true, it's really gonna change the way I've done things. And so there's this moment where there's this kind of fear that creeps in and I have to decide, am I going to be brave enough to ask, as is there more? Is there more to what I'm doing? And then see what happens. Maybe you are doing the right thing. Maybe what you're doing is completely in line. If your goal is to embrace the classical tradition, maybe your goal, maybe you are doing all that you should be. But what if there's more? Are we going to be brave enough to ask the question and then see where what happens? And and the only way I think we'll get answers to those um, those questions is through the studying the principles because the principles apply to a multitude of situation exactly and there are more than one way see that's the thing there's more than one way of working out a principle sometimes depending on your circumstances right. you know when you live outside the u.s and you don't have access to a library or, or that sort of thing you know but the, the if you if you're following principles there's usually some way you can make them work even with special needs children or you know, advanced, it doesn't make any difference. It is possible. I, I completely agree. <laughs> so um, is there any final thoughts that you would like to leave um, with us today about your book, about Charlotte Mason, about the classical tradition, or, or anything at all that you would just like us to, to know and think about? Well, when I wrote my book and I got to the very end, I went back and wrote the last chapter and started all over again talking about the idea of synthetic thinking or the idea that knowledge is one that there's a unity in what we know and i think that that is the thing that makes a difference in how we approach education and life and the world and if we get that one thing if we can get our kids to do that one thing most of the rest of it is just is is it's um oh dear there's a polish word that came into my mind um, I need the English. <laughs> I know, I know You're so true. synthetic. It just sometimes <laughs> <laughs> you can't. I think of the word in the wrong language. No, it's the other things, whether they're you know detail specifics related to classical education, or maybe even you know things that Charlotte Mason was doing, and you don't get around to doing them. You know, if you if we manage to do the one thing of teaching our kids to view knowledge as one thing and develop a relationship with it and always be looking for connections and what they know. It's the one thing that's really gonna make a difference in this world that we live in because that is the one thing that our world is bombarding our children with. And I, I have grown children and I can see how it's affected them in spite of growing up in a Christian home, that they've been affected by this fragmentation and this idea that nothing is connected and nothing has any meaning or absolute truth. So if we succeed in that one thing of teaching our children to think synthetically and look for connections and make those relationships, it's the thing that'll make a difference, yeah. regardless of whether you call it classical or Charlotte Mason or anything else. Right, what's in a name? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much for um, talking with us today, for writing the book, for um, being brave enough to, to say it out loud. Um, I really, really appreciate it. And I know everyone who's reading the book is as well. In fact, we're going to read your book in the Expanding Wisdom um, book club community that we have. Uh, we're reading Abolition of Man right now, but when we're done with that, we're going to we're gonna read your book. So I'm really excited to... That's exciting for me. I, I'm looking forward to, to dialogue and, and seeing what happens, you know, in the, in the next year or two with, with the book and, and just how far it goes. Yeah, well, I'm forever grateful. Thank you so much. And thank you for... Uh, for joining us today. Glad to be doing that.